Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us this week on College Journey Conversations here at Capstone Educational Consultants for our September series. We're so excited to have you this evening. And Stephanie Miles, we're so excited to have you once again uh, and see your shining, beautiful smile every single week. Um, I think people should come back just to see that. Oh, absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. How are things in Alabama? I, I see that the, you know, the weather's kind of getting rough uh, around. How, how are things in Huntsville? Things in Huntsville are raining, but uh, we're not getting that storm. It kind of curved off. The people, it keep the people in Gulf Shores and Pensacola in your prayers. They have gotten hit pretty hard. It was a, a, a number two storm, so it was pretty, pretty harsh. Lots of flooding, and still they're flooding. So um, keep them in your prayers. Yeah, we definitely want to keep in our prayers uh, all those that are in the path of, of the hurricane, and uh, we wish you all the best and stay safe. Uh, as you as you move throughout the evening and, and the days ahead. Well, tonight's conversation is going to be a little interesting, don't you think, Stephanie? Um, Literally. Yeah, I mean, we we're gonna we're gonna learn how to kiss the SAT and ACT goodbye forever. Uh, that's kind of a a little saucy title, but we wanna we wanna assure our folks and our viewers that there will be no kissing online. So this is definitely kid friendly. And we want to keep it that way throughout the evening, correct? Right? Wouldn't you agree? That, that is correct. No kissing. <laughs> well, we know there's been a lot of changes um, over the course of the, the last several months uh, with the SAT and the ACT um, and cancellations. We've actually had a, several conversations here on co the College Journey Conversations lineup about uh, our standardized testing and the changes that have taken place. Um, and, and it's really been a, a, a rather huge disruption to the admissions process, wouldn't you agree? Oh, absolutely. Things that have always been a certain way now all of a sudden are not. So absolutely. everybody's scrambling. Yeah, we're kind of scrambling and students are trying to figure out what to do next. And right. so tonight, I think it would be a great idea for us to have a, a short discussion on kind of what kind of standardized testing options are there? What are we facing? What, what are we up against? And you know, our class of 2020, which is, uh, we could say happily enrolled right now, but I'm not sure many of them are happy where they are. Uh, it's kind of an interesting situation, uh, either on campus or at home doing virtual study. Um, but, but our class of 2020 actually went through quite a, a, a drastic season for the spring trying to get those last minute tests uh, taken. Um, and now our class of 2021 is experiencing some of that same uh, situation. However, we've had the opportunity to take it in, in a number of places. Um, in fact, just this past Saturday was the ACT administration, right? And um, we actually had it taken right down the road uh, here at East Quita High School. Um, but you know, it it started an hour late. Yeah. So they're still having some difficulty, right? Even in, even in places where they're able to administer it, they're still having some trouble with that. Um, but luckily they were able to administer the test um, successfully. So that kudos to the students that were able to do that. But I did learn from uh, one of my students today that a friend of hers actually traveled two and a half hours in order to come to this location because it was the nearest one to her uh, that was available. So we're also seeing some decisions that are being made outside the region for students to come long distances uh, to take the test, which is rather interesting because that was a big issue back at, you know, during the college admission scandal not too long ago of, of students traveling across the country to take the test in other regions and other locations. Um, so it's very interesting that that's, that's something that's happening and, and, and with success. It's happening with success and it's being welcomed. And uh, I'm super happy to see that that's taking place. Um, how, what's the tone there in, in Alabama, in, in the Huntsville area that you are aware of with regards to, um, with regards to the availability of the test and, and how or, or if it's being offered? It has. 
they keep changing it. So students are getting, just like everywhere else, um, they're getting frustrated and, you know, I just encourage them to just roll with it. I mean, there's nothing that can be done and, and you can't, what you can't control, you just have to deal with. And they're aware of it and don't let it discourage them. The colleges are aware of it. So don't get all wrapped up in, oh my gosh. But, you know, the kids that have a, a, a score that they're not happy with, get frustrated. So maybe if they'll do a little regional like you were just talking about, maybe that'll give them the opportunity um, to, to go somewhere else and take it. Um, but that leads into a lot of the other discussions we're fixing to have is um, how easy is that to do for everyday kids? How, right. how, how would people from Huntsville travel three and a half hours to Atlanta, let's just make this up, to take the test? You know, you got to be there and start at eight o'clock. So do you go the night before and get a room or do you leave at four in the morning? Cause y'all are an hour ahead. So, you know, I mean, there's just a lot of factors to consider. Right. And, you know, let's, let's talk about that just a, just a bit because, because there's, there's a lot of talk right now about um, testing and the inequality of students being able to have access to the test um, and preparing for the test, right? And um, what, what, what kind of thoughts do you have on the fact that students might have, um, might have an inequality to, to, to access this test or either of well, these tests? You know, a lot of the students in the public school system, especially in underrepresented um, schools, they have ACT prep at school they often take the test at school and it's made as easy as possible. And they do get the prep that other students um, are, are getting as well. And if the schools aren't running and the schools are only doing half capacity, you know, some kids come on one day, some kids come on the other, it just really makes it hard for those kids to, to get that prep and even to be in the zone of doing it. I mean, you know, going into a test that you know is so important and feeling ill-equipped is a frustration. And, and it's a frustration for the parents, but for the students, I mean, they don't know how to fix it and they can't fix it. Um, so this year is just kind of hard for everybody. I mean, that's just only one example. Um, I mean, kids that can afford to get test prep, whether it be online, that can still happen, which is great and a great, um, tool to use but if you don't have that access then you just don't get it and you go in and hope for the best right you hope for the best and you know even though there are free opportunities like for instance with Khan Academy they have a, a, a wonderful uh, suite of resources for students that are absolutely free and even ACT offers some on their their website free resource study resources um, even though those, those things exist, it's still very difficult for students to, to have access to them, right? Because uh, you know, in order to have access to them, you have to be able to get online, right? Mm -hmm. And not everybody has access to the internet. No. Uh, we, many of us feel like you know, that's, that seems rather strange because we've all, we always have the internet available to us, whether it's in our back pocket um, or is in front of us at work or at home, uh, we have access to it. But, but there are many in this country that don't have access to the internet. So many of the children and students don't. And uh, some can go to the libraries, but here we, you know, for that access, but there, even, even in places like that, you, you are limited to concentration, right? Because you, there are so many distractions. Um, and not only that, but in this pandemic, we've actually watched libraries close down. Like they haven't been open for months. And so students don't have that access to get in. So there definitely is, um, you know, a, a, a big difference, a big chasm there between those who are able to kind of get prep and, and those who can prepare for this test and those who can't. Um, and I think there's, there's a, there's a, a lot of people out there who feel like, and, and I think we're, we're some of those that, that feel like that, that playing field, so to speak, needs to be leveled out a little bit so that that access and accessibility uh, is available for all. 
But you know what? We, we've watched the SAT and the ACT get canceled. We've seen a lot of them, like we even watched ACT attempt to go online, right? We've, uh, we've, we've heard the rumblings of SAT and from the College Board actually uh, want to go online as well. And some, some of them have actually stepped back from that to give it a little bit more time because of the pandemic. Um, so there's, a, there's a, even a, a testing method that's taking place and we're watching it, honestly, we're watching it transform before our very eyes. And unfortunately, the students are the ones are the, kind of in this rapid current uh, that's sweeping them away. Uh, this riptide for, for test prep is just uh, amazing. Um, but we, we see the, these changes taking place right before our very eyes. So the options aren't very clear to us. Um, I do wanna mention one particular option that I have yet to hear um, or read about in any conversations or any publications um, that I'm very familiar with. And that's because of my involvement in the world of Christian colleges and universities. Um, as you know, Stephanie, um, I used to be the director of admissions and enrollment management at Bryan College, a small private Christian liberal arts college in Tennessee. And during my tenure there uh, in the admissions office, learned of a, a test called CLT. And I'm not sure if you've, you've ever heard of that test actually, um, but it's really a valuable resource to families. It's called, it's called the, that's, CLT stands for the classic learning test. Um, you'll, you'll often see it um, accepted by many colleges and universities um, that are Christian or religious in, in relation. Um, schools like, um, to name a few, Geneva College, Grove City College out of Pennsylvania, Messiah College out of Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania, and Liberty University is probably one of the most notorious um, of those schools. Lee University out of Tennessee, to name just a few. Um, but over 187 schools actually accept this particular test. And this is an option, like they list it on their website as, as admissions test options, as SAT, we will take SAT, ACT, or CLT. And most people are like, CLT, what's that, right? So the classic learning test is pretty popular among the homeschool students um, to, uh, to take as well. So something to consider if, if you're, especially if you're considering a Christian college or university, um, take a look at their admissions requirements because the CLT might be a great option. Um, they do, they're not conducting this test or administering this test in person. They've always administered it online. So that's, that's a, a huge benefit to families. Um, price point, pretty similar to the rest, um, but definitely uh, it's shorter. It's not this three hour long test like the SAT or ACT. Um, so it's a great option. If nothing else comes of this conversation, uh, I think it's really important for families to recognize that the CLT, the, the classic learning test is a definite option, um, alternative option for them uh, in light of the fact that SAT and ACT have closed down temporarily and in many places. Have you ever heard of that? that are, I have not. Um, but what I liked about it was the fact that you could do it at your home. Yeah. And it's not all at once. Because what I found with uh, particularly my daughter taking her AP tests is that a lot of the kids couldn't get that button pressed, you know, after they finished and to press it and they were sitting there trying to do it. And there were so many issues with the AP tests across the board. And then they're saying, oh, well, you can make it up. Well, what student wants to do that? I mean, it wasn't fun the first time. Your parents probably made you do it. And now you want to do it again. So having a test that you can take whenever it works in your schedule and not all at once across the board, when you think about how many students would take an ACT or an SAT at the same time, can that be handled online? I'm not sure that it can. I don't know that the systems are in place to be able to do that. Then you almost get finished with the section and poof, it's gone. Right. So, 
what do you do then? So, I mean, there's just a lot of things that have to be worked through. And unfortunately, this 2021 class is kind of the guinea pigs. Um, and I don't mean that in an ugly way, but, you know, colleges are just trying to figure out how they're going to accept and be equitable about it. Right. Because they really do want to be equitable. Right. But, but how do you do that when you can't have a standardized test um, to compare each other? Right. I talked to a group of families today, of course, virtually, right? Um, and we talked a lot about preparing for, um, preparing for and planning kind of your journey for the test, the SAT and ACT. And look, the, the test isn't gone. So like, we don't need to have a funeral for it quite yet, right? So, uh, you know, the slow march music isn't playing quite yet for them, but but it's important to recognize the fact that things are changing. Um, so for those juniors and sophomores and freshmen, um, I, it's important not to, not to quite turn your back on it yet, but to still continue to, to plan for that. And so, you know, we, we of course provide a, an awesome testing timeline planner for our families and we get to use that. And, and it's a great resource to be able to kind of map out when you think you might want to take that, prepare for it if you can. And if you, uh, you know, I know here at least at, at, uh, at Capstone where we do actually do test prep, right? We actually do that here. Um, but we, we have conversations with families who may not be able to actually afford that. And so we work with them uh, very uniquely. So, so you know, we, we've tried to like level that playing field for families as well. So yeah, so planning it out is still gonna be very important. Mm -hmm. But that's not the only issue, right? We were, I was reading an article not uh, printed not long ago uh, in the New York Times. It, it's an op-ed, so you know, that's someone's opinion, of course, right? Uh, right. But, they, but they made some really interesting points that I'd really love to kind of talk about it. And I actually sent it to you today uh, Stephanie, so I hope hopefully you've had a chance to kind of review that, but um, you know, it, it's talking about the absence of standardized tests and what does this world admissions world look like? What does the college application world look like uh, in the absence of tests like SAT and ACT? And it's rather interesting, uh, their point of view and I'd love to kind of dissect this one real small paragraph that they, that they talk about in it. And uh, let, allow me, if you will, let me read this. It's really short, but it says, without standardized tests, the other most common components of a student's college application include aspects that may only worsen inequalities, excuse me, inequities, my bad, uh, that may only worsen inequities. And they mention uh, things like the personal essay and the letters of recommendation. And, and I find that to be very interesting because while on one side, I see where they're, they're, wh what they're talking about with the, with the inequities, because with, for instance, the personal statement essays, let's, let's look at that just for a second. You know, that's talking about experiences, that's talking about um, you know, the, what, what a student has really gone through that's made them grow and develop and, and become the person who they are. Um, and, and that can come from a number of different perspectives. But the inequity I think that this particular writer is referring to um, is the fact that they see that some students, um, they refer to them earlier in the, in the article as the privileged, right? Mm have better experiences or more, uh, well, for the lack of a better term, shinier experiences, more attractive experiences. Um, and, I, and while that might be true and, and, and they may have a point there, I still feel a little as though students, regardless of their experiences, have an absolutely incredible story to tell. And I, I, I'd really welcome your thoughts on that because that's, that's how I think about these college essays, these personal statement essays. 
as, as an opportunity for students to just really fill in the blanks. You know, I'd see it as kind of like a, 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 a human coloring book where you get to choose the colors to, to really bring a vibrancy to who you are and to really lay out um, not only what you've gone through, but how you've grown in it. Um, and, and truly some students, they don't have a, a chance. They, they, they have a hard time to like figure out what that story is and, and to have someone walk them through it is, is definitely uh, helpful, right? Um, but, I, but I'm curious as to, as to what your thoughts are on that. We talked about this a little bit last week and just um, that every story is worth telling. Yeah. And I think a lot of students just don't see that their story is worth it because maybe they didn't get to go on the cool mission trip or whatever it is. But it, like you just mentioned, it's not about necessarily the trip. It's about what has changed you. And if having to take care of your siblings because your mom has to work two jobs, that's a story. That is a story. Because you've stepped in and you have ministered to, you've physically looked after, you've fixed food, all that is worth telling. Yep. And I think as an IEC, that's what we try to help kids understand is that your story is worth telling. Absolutely. And um, I think that's kind of where the disconnect with students is, is that they don't see that they don't have to have the shiny new. They just have to tell their story. Right. And in the personal essay, that is just what you said, a time to do that, to color in what is it like when you go home and you have to get there before your siblings do because you get out of school a little earlier so you can be there so the door is not locked when they walk in. Right. And what is that like? Right. And um, how have you grown? You can look at, you know, when my mom first made me do this, maybe I didn't like it. Maybe I resented it. Maybe whatever it was. And now two, three years later, how have you matured into that? And how have you grown into that? So I, it is, I guess, technically an inequity if you didn't have to do the cool thing, but you know, missions officers always get the cool stuff, but how did that affect your heart? That's right. what matters because your heart and your character is what's going to walk on that campus. Right. It's not the trip. Right. A bunch of kids went on a trip, but your character and what you're going to contribute to that college is what's walking on that campus. Right. Right. Yeah. And I, and I think that's a great opportunity and some great points there, Stephanie. Um, I, I love encouraging students to just really write about themselves in a really rich way. Right. Um, because I, I love their stories and I love to hear how they've become the person they are. And, um, and, and I think admissions is, regardless of the school, I think it, if, if they were honest with themselves, I think admissions is hungry to hear authenticity and um, truth uh, about who they are. And if that's, if that's a, a cruise ship or a paddle boat, it doesn't matter where it exists. Um, it's still a great story. And, um, and I, I, yeah, I just want to encourage students to kind of move, move uh, excitedly through that journey because I think it's a, it's a great place to be. Um, yeah, so the letters of recommendation in this op-ed that we were talking about is the second thing they list as something that would only worsen inequalities inequities. I keep saying that and I need to stop. It's in inequities um, that only worsen the inequities. And, and the letters of recommendation from successful mentors is interesting because not every student has a mentor, right? And sometimes they're in this world um, all by themselves, um, making, making life, making the best of their life. And um, whereas you know, the, this, the, their friend next to them in the, in the, the next desk over um, might have what they would consider the, the most uh, awesome mentor or awesome person for their recommendation. And um, what do you think about that? 
I think students tend to um, downplay themselves mm -hmm. and not give themselves enough credit. And I think most students have at least one teacher that mm -hmm. they could talk to or whether it's a youth leader at their church or, you know, a manager at their job or whatever the situation is. There's somebody that they kind of talk to and there's somebody they look up to. And, you know, particularly in the South, you know, people are willing to take people under their wings if they're, if they want to learn or if they want to um, do better. I mean, they really do. And be brave and ask for a letter of recommendation because they want to tell your story with you. So um, I, I think if the student won't sell themselves short and will give someone the opportunity to praise them. Yeah. And I think, um, well, you and I were talking about this a little earlier. Sometimes it's hard to take that love from someone else, Yeah. you know, and um, let them shine for you. So yeah. give somebody the opportunity to do it because most people want to do that. Yeah. Uh, I have never turned down writing a letter of recommendation from somebody right. because if, if you're going to think enough of me to ask me to write it, then I consider that a privilege. Yeah, absolutely. It's an honor to do something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the third thing this author writes in this op-ed um, that would only worsen inequities and I want to really spend some time on this one, uh, Stephanie, because it, it kind of, uh, I don't know, it kind of, it hit a nerve, right? Yeah. So, but it, but it talks about uh, the calls from well-connected college counselors. And I was, I was a little set back by that, right? Um, first of all, what does that mean? And uh, yeah, right. Yeah. So I kind of like, I kind of raise my eyebrows and, you know, pull my cheeks back a little bit because I don't, I'm not sure I want to say it, but, um, you know, that the, the calls from well-connected college counselors implies, of course, that there are high school college counselors that have some sort of connection with admissions offices at certain schools. And, you know, while that may be true to some extent, um, I, I want to I want to make it very clear that we're we're not high school college counselors, right? That, that's not what we do. We're uh, and and we're independent consultants and college consultants for families. And um, you, you're not going to find any well connected college phone calls from us <laughs> with regards to your students, right? Because it does it 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 creates a conflict. Yes. between, um, you know, who you are and, and your connections, right? We value our relationships with college admissions, um, but it's important that because of the memberships that we're a part of, we, you and I are both are professional members at the Independent Education Consultants Association, IECA, and the Higher Education Consultants Association. And, and it's real important uh, by being a part of organizations such as that, that we subscribe to the fact that we don't leverage those relationships uh, for the benefit of admissions. Um, we personally leverage those relationships for personal development uh, to learn more about them as an institution, maybe them as an individual, you know, relationships are relationships, but never for the benefit uh, and privilege to the student um, for admission, for the sake of admission. So that's that's super important to to point out. And um, and you know, I, I hope that that students are getting into colleges and universities because of their own merit, because of who they are, because how they're represented in their essay, and how their references, uh, big or small, right have honestly and, um, and authentically relayed what they think about this particular student. Um, I, I would hope that their grades reflect who they are and how they study. And uh, if they have the opportunity to submit a test, uh, results that it's a, a, a pure reflection of their abilities academically. Um, yeah, so what, do you what are your thoughts when you read that? What did you think? 
Well, varsity blues is what kind of came up in my head. Isn't that the truth? Um, which really, you know, when all that broke, it wasn't surprising because, you know, people always try to game whatever system it is, they try to game it. Yep. Um, it was just very discouraging to me that and prove the point that there are inequities. Yep. But that's the rare. I, I don't think that that is prevalent everywhere by any means. No. And, you know, there are always going to be people that do the wrong thing. There are always going to be people that try to um, get in where otherwise on their own, they wouldn't. And there's really nothing we can do about that. Right. But for those of us that um, have a standard to which we ascribe and that we uh, always set to it, to, to what we want to do on a daily basis, we're not going to do that. No. We will help you prep. We will help you think through your essay. We will put you in the best light possible within the ethical boundaries that we need to. And mm -hmm. You know, at the end of the day, do you really want to be somewhere that you got in by basically cheating? Because that's what they were doing. Right. And the answer is no. I don't think most students do. You know, as much as you may want to get into that whatever school, at the end of the day, do you really want to by cheating? I, I would I would venture to say no. Right. Um, it just, it, it, it was very disheartening when that whole thing broke. And I think the majority of us... Um, we're saddened about because it makes people like us look really bad. And um, going back to calling colleges, I mean, I, I mean, you always, you can call a college and, and get information and try to, to, um, to understand what they may be looking for as far as garnering knowledge, but to use it in, in an unethical way is, is not a part of what we want to do. That's right. And it's not, what we do, right? So, yeah, most definitely, and uh, it 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 saddens my heart that that takes place. Um, I'm I'm super glad some of it has come to light on, yeah. in unfortunate circumstances in the last year or so. Um, but but I want to be clear about one thing uh, in this in this particular conversation. I want to be clear about the fact that we love our high school college counselors. Absolutely. We absolutely at Capstone Educational Consultants. We we love our high school college counselors. We love what they do. Uh, we support them in in all their activities and and reinforce all of their suggestions to their students. Um, and I'm always, as you are, pointing them right back, pointing our students right back to their college counselor to make sure uh, that that everybody is in the loop. And so. You know, they have a hard job and they, they're on the front lines every day of what they do uh, working with our students and uh, they deserve a huge applause and they unfortunately go unnoticed um, in most cases. But, but I wanted to be clear about that because we absolutely love what they do um, and, love, and love them in, in every way. Good deal. Well, tonight is a very interesting night. It was our intention not to be a very long night, uh, but we wanted to, uh, you know, with every kiss, it's short and sweet. And so this kiss to say goodbye to SAT and ACT is going to be a sweet one as well. Uh, any, any, any final thoughts uh, from you, Stephanie, about, about anything that we've discussed tonight? I would just as I've said before, make the best of the situation. Uh, colleges are aware that it's crazy. And so the norms of someone saying, well, when I went through school two years ago, it was like this. Right. Do not compare yourself to that. Mm -hmm. That's just all out the window at this point. Right. And, you know, as a student, if you have a particular worry about a college that you really, really love, call their admissions person. Yeah. Just call them and say, I'm worried about this, or this is my concern. And then let them tell you what they want or what they see or encourage you, which they will, because they want students to want to go to their schools. Absolutely. So, you know, it's okay. Call, 
call the school. They're not going to go, oh, that shows demonstrated interest. They want to see that you really care. So in this crazy time, it's okay to take a little more on yourself and call them. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to just encourage you, don't get discouraged. Yeah. This is going to be okay. We're all going to figure this out together. You're not alone. Absolutely. Not alone. We're in this with you. And, you know, my final thoughts is more of kind of a summary of kind of, uh, of, of the options that might be available for those that are testing uh, for, for standardized testing options. Um, one we mentioned earlier in the episode of the, the classic learning test, the CLT. Uh, as I mentioned before, it's available and offered, uh, excuse me, it's accepted by some 180 plus colleges and universities across the country. Many of them are Christian colleges or religiously oriented colleges. Um, so, so that's important to consider. Second is if you have the opportunity to take the SAT and the ACT, either or, um, you know, make a great effort to do the best you possibly can do on it. If you've already taken it and you have a score, consider and you have a score, a, a, a good score, right? You're happy and satisfied with that score. Then, then you may very well uh, still submit it to your test optional schools. Uh, we've heard so many stories about colleges and universities moving to be test optional. Tufts, for example, has moved for the next three years. They announced they're gonna hold that stand for the next three years. But optional means just that. So if you have a test and you want to submit it, then it's going to be part of their review process and they're going to consider that score, but you don't have to submit it. That's why it's optional. It's not gonna, if you don't submit it and someone next to you does, it doesn't make you less of a candidate because you didn't submit it when they're test optional. It just means it won't be part of the consideration. And so that, that's an important aspect. Whereas if a school is test blind, which is a little different, if it's test blind, then they, they're not even gonna look at the score even if you show up with it tattooed on your forehead. They're not gonna see it. Well, that's not a good idea, right? So, but they're not even gonna consider it, right? So they're gonna be literally blind to that score report. So, so those are some considerations moving forward. Those are some options. I honestly have to admit, it's not very many, right? Not many options in this moving forward. But uh, there are many, many possibilities and combinations. So we certainly thank you for joining us tonight. And we thank you for watching and being a part of our evening tonight. We're super excited to have this week's College Journey Conversations about uh, the standardized testing options that are above uh, in front of us. We hope you'll join us next week uh, on our, our, in our next College Journey Conversations in our September series right here. Uh, on Facebook Live at 7 p.m. Wednesday. We hope you'll, you'll be here. We'd love to have you. Goodbye.